Hi, so I'm Abhishai. Hi, nice to meet you all. Um, good day, everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to today's session about Brazilian design using heat theory. Um, a little bit about CLDB. CLDB is a company that develops the open source database CLDB. It's a real time database that can handle a lot of data, like big data that, uh, uh, workloads uh, scaling to uh, terabytes and petabytes. It's a drop-in replacement for uh, Apache Cassandra, meaning it uses the same protocol and same API, it's compatible. And also it has API compatibility with DynamoDB, um, but it is high performance, high performance as in 10 times the performance of Cassandra with low latency, even on the tail, meaning P99, like very, very low P99 and so on. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but um, right now we have more important things to cover like QPOE. So a little bit about myself, I am a developer advocate for CLDB. Uh, before being a developer advocate for CLDB, I worked in various places uh, like a um, venture capital uh, firm uh, last two years. Um, I've been in the, an engineering manager at Wix, uh, where I worked on uh, high scale uh, serving systems, that kind of stuff. And before that, I was a secure and co-founder of a few bytes. So, Basically, I've been working in this field for like uh, 15 years, more or less, I guess. I feel kind of old now. Um, so, wait one second. Before we get started, I would like to run a short debugging session, uh, if you will. So, let's show you some graphs. So, we've got a lot of engineers here, which is also always awesome. So, um, Here's a couple of graphs. This is a graph for an application that, um, uh, that I ran in uh, EC2. And as you can see, there's the bottom line here is the latency from the viewpoint of the application and load balancer. The load balancer is an ALB, application load balancer, standard Amazon stuff. Um, the graph on the top is the throughput. Now, as you can see, at some point, the latency of the, as shown from the load balancer started to rise, although the application side is pretty low. So the application side is showing consistent average latency of um, about hundred milliseconds. Whereas the application, the load balancer side shows latency that keeps on climbing to around at the peak here, around uh, one second average latency, which is like very, very high. So um, anyone has an idea why this could happen? Um, use the Q&A button to answer. Anyone? So the reason for this latency here, oh, so uh, Clara Costa has an answer for us and a few others. Nice, so I'm gonna read uh, some of the, uh, the um, answers. Um, coordinated domission is one. Uh, coordinated, coordinated domission is mostly related to the results on the load testing side, load tester side. So uh, it wouldn't show up on the monitoring um, of the load balancer and the application side. Uh, the application side. Um, other questions, application throughput is less than the load throughput. Um, that's actually not the case, so almost exactly the same. Um, other results, requests, yeah. So queue is filling up, queuing, latest law, yeah, that's all correct. So what we are observing here is basically uh, queuing latency. Um, so basically we have always a queue between the application and the load balancer and that queue is filling up. And the result is that the requests are uh, waiting in the queue and therefore um, the, they experience latency from waiting inside of the queue. So that's basically one of the many reasons why queuing theory is very important because you can actually observe in a lot of production systems, um, the effect of the, uh, of, of the basically queuing. And a lot of the latency that we experience in real world systems actually comes from queuing and not from processing and um, you know, basically CPU load and uh, database load and that kind of stuff. So let's uh, talk a little bit about queuing theory. 
Turing theory was, uh, is a mathematical theory, a mathematical field that was originally developed in the early uh, 20th century by um, Agnel Koop Ellen, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. He was a Swede and uh, he, he basically developed this for the Swedish uh, phone company. Back in the day, they were still using a switchboard, mechanical switchboard, and they had people that were basically, that were physically connecting um, the wires on the switchboard. And you had to wait in line to get an operator in order to be connected. So in order to minimize the wait time for the operators, and, and they need to know how much capacity of operators they needed to put in at every given time of the day or in every day of the week. So they hired um, Erlang to develop a mathematical model for this. And he solved this for um, a number of different types of uh, key workloads uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. And then after that, um, a lot of other mathematicians started working on this and solved this for more and more models. And uh, we actually use this in a lot of places in the industry today. Um, if you went to a theme park like Disney World, they actually use it to uh, design the queues in uh, Disney Park. They use it in, um, in traffic, uh, like uh, roads. Uh, they use it, of course, in computers, and so on, so on, so on. So on the agenda today, we're going to cover, we're going to talk a little bit about statistical variation in distributions. We are going to talk about Q theory itself, like a little bit of an intro to Q theory. If we have time, we're going to cover Little's Law, and we're going to discuss practical applications of Q&T in Little's Law. So let's start by talking a little bit about variation in statistical distributions. So I'm going to turn this off for a second. Great. So um, basically anything, everything in the world, although we, we tend to treat measurements as a, a single number, um, let's, let's talk about my height, for example. So I'm uh, um, 170 meters uh, high. Um, and if I measure myself every day, or if you, uh, I'm going to get different results. I'm not going to get exactly 170 a day. Um, why? Because sometimes, because in the morning and in the evening, there's like slight differences, which are very small. We don't usually take them into account. And every day, I, my height is a little bit different. And also the measurement instruments that I, that I use might be different a little bit. So what I'm actually going to get is I'm going to get the distribution of results around 100, 170 centimeters. I'm not going to get 170 exactly. And this is the case with everything that we measure. Everything has a distribution in the, in the world. And also when we're talking about workloads, um, you know, in, in servers or, or anywhere actually, uh, we're going to get a distribution of latencies, a distribution of throughput, a distribution of, of request sizes and so on. This also means that re improbable results do happen. The distributions can be very, very wide. They often go almost into infinity. And uh, even the tail, the stuff that's very improbable actually does happen if you know, we have enough events. So when we're talking about computers, we sometimes have millions and billions of, of operations. And uh, that means that even stuff that happens once in a million is gonna happen for sure. Uh, this is known as the law of really, really big numbers and stated uh, simply, it says that in a city like New York, where you have 25 million people, um, one in a million events happen every day. The other thing about distributions is when we look and talk about distributions, we need to remember uh, what kind of effects we're talking about. Do we feel the aggregate effect of the entire distribution or a particular effect of one measurement in the distribution? Um, you can think of the difference between as the difference between a load on the server, which is um, generated by all of the transactions together. No single transaction generates, you know, the entire load. So that's basically the aggregate effect. And then we care about aggregates like um, sums or averages, um, and the particular effect. Each user experiences one transaction, one transaction only. So they don't actually care about like the. the the overall effect of the distribution, they only care about where in the distribution they happen to be, uh, which is kind of random in, in many cases. So um, we need different types of metrics to, um, to give information about individual user effects or particular effects. Uh, those would be percentiles. We'll talk about that in a bit. But the thing is, a single numeric aggregate can never capture the entire behavior of the distribution. 
uh, doesn't matter if it's median or 99 percentile, it's enough information to capture the, the, the shape of the distribution. One of the most common aggregates used is mean or average. And that's a very, very bad aggregate for most use cases. It doesn't represent individual experience. Like we said before, it, it's more related to uh, the aggregate effect of the distribution. Um, so for latency, for example, latency is a, basically a measurement that the user sees, a user experiences transaction latency. It's a very, very bad um, aggregate for latencies. Um, I can give you an, an example. For example, if I shoot someone in the head uh, 1,000 times and I hit, I hit him once, on average, that person is alive, but in practice, we all know he's, been, he's dead. So when, you, when outliers are the thing that matters, okay, and this is the case for user experience, if a user happens to wait, uh, let's say, 20 seconds is going to be annoyed and go away. And it doesn't matter that all the rest of the requests in, in the user transaction happen, um, were very fast. It's enough to have one slow transaction to annoy the user and the user will go away. So in those cases where outliers have um, a very powerful effect, it doesn't, like the average doesn't matter. What matters is the high percentiles. And this is very important to remember. The other thing about distributions, especially if we're talking about the high percentiles, is how wide the distribution is. And we have various measurements to how wide the distribution is. We call that variance. Um, we can measure it with standard deviation, variance, uh, interquantile distance, uh, mean average deviation, so on, so on, so on. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, ways of measuring variation. Um, most of the statistics we use is, is built around standard deviation, but sometimes we use other um, aggregates. It depends on, on like the model that we use. Um, what is important is that we, we understand like how wide the distribution is because the, the variance um, or dispersion has a lot of effects that are very interesting. We'll talk about that in a bit. The other thing about distributions is that distributions in, in the physical world are not bounded. They actually go all the way to infinity. Um, you can have something that takes, you know, uh, 10 milliseconds, and then the, the same thing can, it can take one second, 10 seconds, or even a year. The thing is that computer systems are bounded. We basically do a cutoff or timeout after a certain period. So this, the distributions we we see in our monitoring systems and uh, in databases and so on are. are basically cut off. And those cutoffs are being translated in our monitoring systems into errors and timeouts. Um, so when we're talking about the really high percentiles, the really high percentiles would only appear as errors. Um, and also when we're talking about variations, fundamentally everything has a variation, but and it's very easy to raise the variation. All you need to do is just add a random jitter or something like that or noise, but reducing variation is very hard. And usually if you try to reduce the variation, you either need to have a better system, a better database, a better CPU or whatever, or uh, artificially introduce you know, um, some kind of weight to compensate and move the entire distribution to, to the right, to the, the higher numbers. Uh, and that's also very expensive. So why do we care about variability? Uh, the reason we care about variability is because all of our systems have to be designed to handle the peak or the, um, the outliers. Um, it's impossible to design a system that only takes into account like the most probable results or just the mean. And for example, let's say that you have a train that you, and you need to get to some meeting, um, let's say every day, and you have to go from Paris to London and the train takes two hours to, uh, to get from Paris to London. But the, the train also sometimes is late um, the mean delay is 15 minutes and the P95 delay is 60 minutes and the P99 delay is 120 minutes. But if you want to make sure that we arrived on time, let's say by 99% um, uh, SLA, then we need to take the train very, very early. You need to take the train, let's say uh, at least two hours. You have to be at the, the dock two hours early just in case the train uh, is late. So we're going to be wasting two hours almost 
all the time. Um, on average, we'll be wasting 105 minutes almost every day. And we'll be late only once in 100 uh, days. If we wanted to be to make sure, let's say, uh, that we're never late, we would have to, uh, to have an even bigger safety margin, maybe even five hours, depending on the you know, even higher percentiles. So we're going to waste most of the time that we're on the dock just because the train has highly variable um, delays. And that's very, very expensive. And this is also the case in most of our systems. So what this means is that utilizations in computer systems is limited by high variation. If we have um, high variation in load throughout the day, if we have high variation in load, uh, let's say in a 10 second uh, window, um, we're going to have to have higher and higher utilization. This also impacts um, processes that have to wait for stragglers. Let's say um, things like MapReduce or fault join or anything that parallelizes and then has a serial, uh, serial part at the end. So uh, for MapReduce, for example, reducers have to wait for the last mappers. Uh, let's say you have 1,000 uh, map tasks. Even if one of them is being delayed, that's like uh, the 99.9 percentile, um, the entire job is going to be, uh, to be delayed. So the metric that would dictate the overall uh, completion time for, uh, for the job would be the P999, not average, not even P99. And therefore, customer satisfaction, because um, in, in a lot of transactions, we have parallel parts. Uh, even when you load a web page, you have to load, uh, let's say, 100 assets, CSS, um, images, uh, JavaScript, and so on. So if you need to, um, need to load, let's say, 100 or 200 uh, assets, there's a very, very good chance you're going to hit the P99 at least once. And it was actually a very nice computation of this by Gil Tenet. Also disasters, they follow the day behavior, the high percentiles. Um, most, if not all of the uh, disasters are caused by some outlier that we didn't plan for and we couldn't cope with. And when you have high, um, high variation, and when you have outliers, a lot of them get, get translated to errors in timeouts, like we said before, because our systems are bounded. And when this happens, we're going to have failure demand. Let's, for example, retries. Uh, we tried to read something from the database. Um, we had a timeout, we couldn't read. So we're going to do a retry. And then therefore we're going to apply additional load on the database just because we couldn't do the thing right to begin with. So this is known as failure demand and also reduces the utilization we can run, in, run at because we have higher and higher and because of the failure demand. It all boils down to this. The variance is the engineer's enemy. This is something that's like, um, very, very fundamental. Um, the higher the variance, the harder the system is going to be to, to run, um, the, higher it's, the, the harder it's going to be uh, to, uh, to get higher utilization from it. Um, and of course, we're going to have higher latency and that kind of stuff. And this is basically the, 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 the problem that we have in, uh, that we're dealing with in QPO. Now, um, those, we would like to have a short poll um, that we want to share with you today to help them to better understand uh, your point of view and why you came into this webinar and what you're looking uh, to learn here. So take a minute and answer this, please. We're going to give it a few minutes, sorry, a few moments. Two more seconds. Cool. So let's talk about queues. So queues are everywhere. Um, 
futures, executors, they all have a queue inside. It's basically a, a number of threads, a thread pool attached to, uh, to a queue. Um, sockets have a queue. It's the, usually known as the backlog queue or the listen queue. Um, locks, they're not called queues, but they behave mathematically as, as a queue. And um, like NetD, Node.js, uh, all of those uh, callback-based systems, they have something called the reactor, and that reactor has one giant queue where all the callbacks go and go to. So that also has a queue. Um, if there's a, na a nas asynchronous thing, there's a good chance there's a queue, you know, somewhere um, inside. So anything you think is suspect. There's a queue somewhere there. And because the queues are everywhere, it's very important to understand how they behave. Um, but before we, we discuss that, let's talk about like what, what actually is a queue. So a queue is basically, first we have an, an, an arrival rate. We have uh, some incoming load that arrives at some rate. And we have a service center or a worker that services this, uh, this load. Um, we call it a service center or a worker. And it has some rate in which it services the, this workload. And there is a service discipline, which is to say uh, an algorithm by which we select work to, uh, to be done from the queue. Um, we know a lot of those algorithms like FIFO, uh, first in, first out, LIFO, last in, first, uh, first out, uh, priority queues, and so on. There's also um, a kind of a nice algorithm called Israeli queue, uh, which is basically um, when a job gets selected, it, it also brings its friends with it. Um, if you ever saw an, a queue in Israel, you know what I'm talking about and why this is called an Israeli queue, but it's actually useful sometimes. Um, and the latency we observe is basically um, the sum of the wait time and the service time. So the time it takes to, from, for the work to actually handle this sort of transaction and the time that we wait in the queue. And there's an assumption in, in most of the models that the service time is independent of the, the queue. This assumption actually holds uh, for most of our systems. But this is the basic structure of the queue. But how does this queue behave? How do queues behave? So this is a very simple model. This is known as the MM1 model, uh, which is basically a queue with one service center. And this basic behavior applies to almost all queues. Um, so we're going to discuss this model because it's simple to understand and it, it's a good representation of, of queues. What we see in this model is that latency rises very sharply. Uh, at the beginning when we, uh, so the X axis is utilization and the Y axis is the, the queuing time or the queue size. And what we can see here that um, as utilization begins to increase, initially the latency goes up very, very slowly, but it's very non-linear. As we approach the high utilization percentiles, latency starts to rise very, very quickly, uh, violently even. Um, so I'm going to use this queue emulator. You can look at it afterwards. Uh, which is basically a small calculator for uh, queuing theory that uh, I uh, wrote. And we can play with, with this here and see how uh, the queues behave. So this is what I'm going to be using in a second. But this is basic behavior. So what does it mean? First of all, it means that if we want to have decent quality of service, we have to run at low utilization, like a good uh, Thumbool would be to run at less than 75% utilization. But again, this depends on the system. And this also means that if we, if we want to have this latency in our systems, we have to have overcapacity. This is unavoidable. If we're not going to have uh, over, uh, overcapacity, if we're not going to do, do capacity planning with overcapacity in mind, we're going to run into higher and higher latency because of queuing. The problem, what does this happen? The problem is that um, the, the rate in which we get work is not constant. If we had a very coordinated system in which work arrives, uh, let's say every second, uh, like nice packets, we wouldn't have this. But the arrival rate fluctuates and also the service time fluctuates it's because of the distributions, distributions we have. And the delays accumulate but the ideal time is wasted. What, what does it mean? Um, if a worker doesn't have any job to do, it can't bank this time. It just it can't do anything. We can't save this time for later. But on the other hand, if the, the worker is busy and suddenly we get three, four, five items at the same time in a very short time period, 
it's going to queue up. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation. We can't win when we're, we don't have work. We can't like, save it for later. Um, but we can only, but when there's overload, it accumulates for later. So it's, we can only lose in this situation. This is why we have queuing. Um, basically what it means is that queues are almost always full or near empty. We almost can't observe queues in an intermediate state, so to speak. So the implication of this is that if you have an infinite queue, uh, even a slight overload will kill you. Um, you're gonna have the queue filling up very, very fast and you're going to run into memory pressure and out of memory conditions when the queue becomes too big. And this is something you actually um, encounter in production many times. And unfortunately, there's a lot of unlimited queues in various places in programs. For example, um, executors in Java by default have unlimited queues. There are a number of uh, drivers, sync drivers that have unlimited queues and therefore and whenever you have some kind of slowdowns, you're going to get into memory pressures. I personally caught a bug like this in the RabbitMQ uh, Java driver. Also, if you have very long queues, you're going to have high latency because, because when the queue fills up, anything on the queue is going to wait a long, long time. This is also, also uh, runs the risk of stale work. Um, if you have waited in the queue for, let's say, 10 seconds, by the time this request is going to be serviced, uh, maybe the client is not in a, not interested in the response anymore. You're going you're going to service that request, but the, that work is going to be uh, to be wasted because like no one's actually going to look at the answer. So what we do is we always limit queue size. Uh, we don't want to have unbounded queues. There are some number of cases when we do, but it's like very rare. Um, and also we try to have. TTL on work items. So uh, when we uh, take a work item out of the queue, we look at the TTL and we, uh, we can see if there's a point servicing that uh, work item. If it's too old, we can just throw it away. So going back to, um, to our diagram, this is the formula for uh, the wait time, the uh, mean wait time in the queue. And Basically, the, the, the wait time is not only proportional, not only related to the, to the workload, but only to the, also to the speed of the service center. So I'm going to um, switch to my calculator for a bit. And this knob here is the speed of the server. So for a faster server, as you can see, we get a better and better latency curve. So if the server is slow, latency will go up very rapidly, even like uh, starting from 75% or so. But as the service, the server becomes faster and faster, you can actually go to higher utilization and still have decent latency. So this is one of the interesting things that we learned from this model. Um, the latency in, in absolute numbers is proportional to service time. And the slower the service, the higher the queuing latency is going to be. So the, what this means is that if you have a system that's made up of, of a number of parts and each one of those parts have a queue, you want to have the slower parts run at lower utilizations because if you don't, they will have higher queuing latency and they're going to slow the rest of the system. The other problem is the utilization is not constant. Um, let's say that you plan to um, for 50% uh, utilization. Um, if utilization fluctuates by 10%, it's going to be in, an increase from 50% to 55%. And if we go back to the um, to our uh, calculator, so going from 50 to 55 is an increase of about 20% in uh, in load. And sorry, in latency. That's not very high. But in 90%, if we go from 90% to 99%. That's a tenfold increase in latency. We went to almost to 100 from about nine. So that's a tenfold increase in latency. So this means that you need to be very, very careful when you're running at high utilization. Um, when you're running at high utilization, even tiny fluctuations can cause a rapid increase in latency. So we need to be very, very careful. And if we have highly varied load, we need to run at very low utilizations and cap the, the variation so it doesn't get out of control. 
this is the Kingman formula. This is a model that takes into account um, the variation in service rate and in the arrival rate. So we can actually see uh, what happens to our, to our latency um, because of distribution, because of the variation in the load itself. So let's let's see what's going on. So this is uh, the Kingman formula uh, calculator, and this is not for the service rate and arrival rate uh, variation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move this a little bit, and as you can see, as the variation increases, the latency curve becomes very very bad, very rapidly. And if that's not bad enough, when the variation is higher, it also responds more violently, violently to, um, to what happens to the service center. So um, let's say that I want to make my service center faster to get a bit latency curve. The latency curve will still increase, but not, it will not increase as well for a high uh, variation workload. So, you can see the higher the, vari in the variance in the distribution of, of the workload, the shittier the, this latency curve is going to be. And the same is true for the arrival rate as well. If I uh, move this variation for the arrival rate, as you can see, again, the latency curve becomes worse and worse. And if the service center is slower, again, latency is going to suffer. So the lesson here is this, the higher the variance, the worse the, uh, the latency and the utilization curve is gonna get. So this means that when we have high variance, either on the, service, um, on the server or on the arrival rate, we will need to run at lower utilization. So what do we do in practice? First of all, we use checkpoint and choke points. We use throttling load shedding to, um, to get rid of excess load. We're gonna talk about that in a bit. Um, we also need to do proper capacity planning. If we have um, slow, uh, slow uh, resources, we run them at lower utilization. If you have um, some services that have higher variation for the service rate, we're going to have to run them at lower utilization. If we can improve the, uh, the variation by building a better service or using a database that has uh, lower variation gives you um, lower percentile, high, lower numbers for the high percentiles, then we can, run, we can run at higher utilization. So that's one of the ways to reduce variations. Um, and Celia, for example, is very, very good at this. Um, this is a graph that compares the 99 percentile um, of Cassandra with Scylla. This is from one of our clients that actually replaced uh, Cassandra of this Scylla. And as you can see, the, the 99 percent of, of Scylla is not only lower, it's also less variant. It's very, very constant. So this is how Scylla helps you, for example, to run your system with lower variation because in the, in the distribution of the responses from Scylla is better. So um, in a system that has a lot of parts, we have internal queuing. Um, you have a workload coming in from the front and then it sends the workload to another system, another system, another system that could be a database or a microservices architecture. And you can have internal queues that fill up and cause latency. And that can get out of control because the uh, generator of the workload, meaning the client has no idea that the system has some kind of queue uh, inside, deep inside. So, how do we deal with this? The way we deal with this is known as back pressure. Basically, uh, the part that gets overloaded deep in the system will need to start pushing back, apply back pressure to, um, to its counterpart that's overloading it. Um, basically say, okay, I've had enough, I've got, I'm overloaded. And that service will say the same thing to, um, to its clients and th those clients will say the, th the same thing to their clients and so on, so on, so on. And th this is basically a way to pass in this information that somewhere along the line, there's an overload all the way to the original client. Um, and almost all the protocols support this, all the synchronous protocols anyway. So TCP has TCP back pressure, uh, HTTP has uh, 503 responses, and a lot of other protocols have uh, their own ways of, of saying this. 
Um, and of course, if you use queues, if the queues are finite, then when the queue is, um, is full, this is basically a way to signal, okay, this is back pressure. I've had too much. So thread pools, if you want to implement back pressure, just limit the, the size of the queue for a small number. So um, how do we build this? Blocking code has back pressure by default, unless of course you have some kind of thread scaling uh, and you add threads when, uh, when, when the queue uh, fills up. But if you don't, or if you have a limit, then eventually the code, the code will block. And when it blocks, of course, whoever calls it will also block and so on, so on, so on. And you have this blocking chain that is basically passing the back pressure very nicely. Um, if you have some sync executors or remote calls or stuff like this, you will need to have it to put in, in uh, explicit back pressure. For an example, Alex Java, uh, reactive streams, that kind of stuff, that's basically a way to implement back pressure. Um, but if you're talking about systems like Kafka, they do not have back pressure by default. And if for some reason the uh, consumer becomes slower than the producer, then um, you're going to have a buildup of queue inside Kafka. Um, and, and you need somehow to tell the producer to slow down. Um, so you need to implement your own mechanism of back pressure on, on top of Kafka. And um, there's a number of, of open source projects that do this. Yeah, you can look it up online. And when we have properly implemented back pressure, then the front layer, usually uh, a web server, will know that there's uh, overload somewhere in, inside the system. And now we can do something useful with this information. We can load shed. We can say, um, okay, the arrival rate is too high. We need to somehow get rid of some of this load. Uh, it's basically a trade off between latency and error rate. If we do not return errors, if we do not reject some of the load, latency will start to increase because of queuing. So we need to reject some of the load. How do we do this? One of the ways is we, we have a queue. Um, uh, at the, at the web server or the front layer side, uh, we can cap it. And then anything that doesn't fit in the queue, we're going to reject it. How we're going to reject it, we can return a 503 response. Uh, we can do some kind of de uh, graceful degradation uh, by presenting, let's say, a cached version or uh, send it to a fallback service or give like um, uh, stale results or something like this. We don't have to return those. That's not necessarily the only option. But the thing is, we need to remove it from this queue and move it to something else that's cheaper and has capacity. Another way is to throttle arrival rate. Um, we can calculate um, the rate that we can handle and then have some kind of counter. And then anything that goes on top of this counter, we just throw it away or send it to the fallback, um, however it is that we do uh, our degradation. A nice example of this, I put a link here on the slides, you can look at it later. Um, it's a link to, um, to an article about how Facebook does this with uh, LIFOQ. It's a pretty a nice strategy. Look it up later. So uh, how are we in time? Uh, yeah, well, I think we'll skip LIFOQ's law and go straight to practical applications. So um, one of the practical applications is thread sizing. How do we properly compute the number of threads that we can that we need to have on a threaded server? So this is the basic structure of a threaded server. We have a socket um, that has something that is a queue, uh, the backlog queue uh, that's managed by the kernel. And then we have some thread that accepts requests from, from the socket, puts the, the requests, the accepted requests in a queue in user space. And then we have a thread pool that runs basically the user code that takes work from this queue and uh, runs it and handles it. So we have uh, um, multiple workers um, fitting from single queue. There's a model for this in queuing theory. It's called the MMC model. You can look at that later or in uh, some other lecture. And basically, um, the thing about sizing is that there are two ways to be wrong here. We can use too many threads or not enough threads. If you use too many threads, then we're going to wait on the, the operating system queue, uh, the scheduler. We have a limited number of CPUs. So uh, let's say four workers, four CPU workers, and the operating system manage that using a queue. And um, if we use too many threads, then we're going to have too many requests in that queue and we're going to have queuing latency on the thread level. So that's not good. Um, because every one of those threads also consumes memory and if they, they can't actually work, then they're just using those resources and not doing anything useful. 
Also, there's shared resources like uh, database connection tools and that kind of stuff. Um, and if we have a lot of threads, we're going to we're going to need a lot of them. And all of this will end up with very bad quality of service, uh, usually followed by, by uh, GC storms um, because we have we're going to get out of uh, out of memory and very very ungraceful degradation because in a preemptive system. Um, when you, you have a lot of threads contesting for limited CPU resources, um, all of them are going to, to behave very badly and give the client uh, very high latency. So that's not good. On the other hand, if we don't have enough threads, work will queue up on the external queue, on, the, um, on this queue here. And again, we will have high latency. Also, we won't be able to utilize the, the CPUs of the, of, of the server and reach high utilization because we will not have enough running threads to uh, consume the CPU. So the end result again will be high latency and low resource utilization. So on, on the left side, we're going to see uh, high CPU usage and, and high latency. On the, low side, on the right side, we're going to see low CPU usage, but also high latency. So that both of them are not good. So what do we want to do? It's basically a trade-off, and it depends what we're optimizing for. Um, so if we can be optimizing for two different things, we can be optimizing for capacity or server utilization or latency. So when we're optimizing for latency, we want to keep the queue as empty as possible to avoid queuing latency, um, which means what we have to block or apply back pressure, and we need to keep the queue small. Basically, and we need to have over provisioning of threads relative to uh, to the workload, so that every time there's work in the queue, there'll be a, a thread that's available to take that work immediately, um, and therefore reduce the, the probability of anything waiting. If we're optimizing for capacity, we're going to do the exact opposite. We will, we will keep the queue full, um, and we want to use a largest queue so that enough work will be in the queue so that every time that a thread becomes available, immediately it will, it will take work from the queue. Um, there will always be work ready for that thread in the queue. So that means we have to, to keep the queue size larger than the, the concurrency or the number of threads. And of course, we will have a smaller number of threads in this case. The basic formula is this. Um, it's, the number of threads is equal to the number of calls times utilization percentage, which we'll discuss in a bit, um, times one plus the ratio between the wait, the wait time and the CPU time. The wait is usually IO wait time. It can also be uh, waiting time for locks and that kind of stuff. Um, but but it's, it's, it's basically uh, the time not spent on CPU. So this formula is, assumption, is assuming that the CPU is a limiting resource. Of course, you can have other limiting resources like database connection, to, uh, database connections or memory and that kind of stuff. Um, and then you have to compute by the limiting resource. And you do this cal calculation, this kind of capacity planning by the maximum load. load. Um, because we don't want to have um, too much latency um, and, during peak hours. And there's a problem when you use Kubernetes and that kind of stuff, which is how many calls we actually have for this. I'm not gonna go into this. Um, the interesting part here is, is the target utilization. So the target utilization is the parameter we use um, and we, de we determine this parameter based on the latency that we wanna have. If you remember by our models, we know that slow resources need to have um, Low utilization. If we have higher variation, we need lower utilization. So we usually start around 75 percent, 75 percent, and we um, go lower from there. Also, we need to account for uh, some CPU that can be used by the operating system for interrupts, uh, for I/O, uh, if uh, we're using Java or something like that for garbage collection, and so on, and so on, and so on. So in practice, we might be uh, starting from something like around 0 0.7, 0 0.6. Um, how do we compute this? We need to get the, the W, the weight and, and CPU times from somewhere. Um, usually it's pretty easy to determine from logs or, or monitoring. Um, the total transaction time, which you can see from in access logs, uh, is basically the wait time plus the CPU time. And the CPU time we can also, we can get from monitoring. We can then see how, man, how much uh, CPU those spreads consumed. 
and divide it by the throughput and therefore get the average CPU time per, uh, per transaction. And then we have basically both those numbers. We just um, uh, subtract the CPU time from the overall transaction time. And then we can compute the, the formula and, and, uh, and see how many threads we need. So pretty straightforward. Um, you can do this, uh, a lot of people already do. Um, or you can uh, just uh, use some kind of flexible uh, thread pool and see what it does. The only problem with doing this is that in case of overload, the, if you don't have a proper maximum computed by this, you will go and you will go into overload and, and have high latency. Another example is Scylla IoT. So basically, um, Scylla is a database that has its own scheduler, um, which is very nice. Look at the CISA project afterwards, uh, very nice. And it needs to deal with disks that have a certain latency. And the thing is, as you, uh, as Scylla receives workloads from the client, it can of course immediately write to the disk or read from the disk. The problem is that if you um, um, start issuing requests to the operating system, once those requests go into the operating system IOQ, you, you don't have control anymore. So you'll be blocked or, or if it's an async IO, you won't be blocked, but you can't cancel those requests. And sometimes um, it, it's very important to be in control of those requests because uh, let's say that you want, you want to service user requests before you do compaction, for example, which is kind of a, an offline activity, the management activity that uh, the database has. Uh, so you want to be able to control and prioritize the workload. Um, so how do you do that? You need to avoid overloading the operating system queue and avoid overloading the disk. So you need to know how many requests you can, um, you can send to the disk in parallel. So what do we do? We measure. So uh, Scylla actually employs something called IOTune. Um, so basically it's a benchmark that uh, Scylla autom automatically runs when you install it on the server. And it builds the queuing latency and the queuing um, and latency uh, a chart of the, um, of the server. And from that latency profile, it deduces what is the saturation point of the disk? Like when will this go into overload? And then we cap the, the amount of, uh, of uh, I requests to the disk uh, based on that. A second. So this is this happens automatically. Um, it's actually uh, pretty nice. You can look at the disk flow uh, project by Avakiviti, um, who is the CTO of Scylla and wrote this thing. So um, um, if there are any questions, now is a very good time for uh, for asking them. So we have a question from uh, Global Costa. What are the what are, are in your opinion the advantages of, and disadvantages of, of lo shedding load from the front of the queue versus the back of the queue? Okay. So um, actually, it really depends on the workload. Uh, when we're talking about interactive workload, um, there's usually an advantage to, to shedding from um, from the the back of the, uh, the queue. Um, the, the, the most recent requests are the requests that you want to handle because um, the requests from the back of the queue are usually requests that maybe the user doesn't are not, is not interested in anymore. Maybe the user um, has been like, waited too long, has been upset, I, or it, if it's a server timed out, uh, it's not interested in the request anymore. So there's no point handling them. So in, when you're talking about um, interactive requests or synchronous requests, Usually, you want to load shed from uh, the back of the queue. You just you want to throw away the the, the oldest requests. Um, in other cases, maybe you want to do it from from um, from the front. But again, it depends on, on like uh, the, the product, I guess, or like what type of requests, you know, or the semantics of the requests, I guess. Other questions. So we're going to give it um, a moment or two. 
for people to ask questions. Some comments. Okay, so um, Guy Mavon is asking, when using back pressure, we still use some CPU to reject the request. Is that negligible? I'm worried about clients who are trying indefinitely and causing a load steal. Um, you're correct. When you're using back pressure, of course, it takes some CPU to reject the request. But the assumption here is that it takes much less CPU to reject than it, than it does to handle uh, the request. Um, if, it's, if this is not the case, you might as well just handle the request. Usually when we, uh, when we uh, reject the request, um, we do this either by returning error, which is very, very cheap, or by showing some, uh, some kind of uh, a cheap version of, of the response, uh, either from cache or from pre-computed pre request, or sometimes uh, in certain algorithms, you can just uh, do an estimation and give an estimated result and so on, so on, so on. Um, when you're talking about retrying indefinitely, yes, that's also a problem. Um, and when you're talking about retrying, there's a way to cap retries to avoid retry storms, but that's like a whole different topic. I'm not going to go into that. Mark Dawson asks, um, do the engineers at CLDB make use of Neil Gunter's universal scalability law in their performance modeling and planning? Um, so the universal scalability law is an amazing law. Um, it's applicable in many cases. Um, we use it sometimes, to my knowledge, but not all the time uh, in performance modeling. And the reason is we try not to get into the into the um, at the parts of the USL where performance starts to decrease. So Scylla is a, is a type of database that scales very well, um, both in terms of calls and in terms of machines. And um, we are usually in the linear part of the USL. Uh, sometimes we might get into uh, the, the uh, contention part, but we uh, try very carefully not to be in the coordination part ever. So like the, the universal scalability law is less relevant for us, um, except for like in very, very huge clusters. So uh, Richard Holmes says, can you go back to the part you skipped? Uh, that'd be Lita's law. So one second, let me finish with the questions and then uh, we will see if we have time. Um, Anonymous D, maximizing utilization is considered good uh, on lower machine prices, and you say you need low utilization to count with various. That is true. Is there a guideline to find a sweet spot? Um, yes, actually there is. If you can reduce variance, that would be amazing because it will allow you to run at, low, at higher utilizations. An alternative would be to use faster machines or, and of course, have faster databases and so on, because again, that will allow you to run at higher utilizations. And the thing about maximizing utilization is it's maximizing doesn't say to how, to how, high, to how high you can reach or what is the maximum of the, the, the utilization you can reach to. Um, even uh, in Google and Facebook places like this, they cannot reach higher utilizations of about 80%, even with, uh, with, with the dense clusters they use um, because of queuing problems. Um, there's a, a mathematical limit to uh, how, how dense you can, you can make things. Um, this is just the reality. So maximizing means squeezing more, but it doesn't mean that you can get to 100%. The sweet spot really depends on uh, on your use case and uh, your actual queuing. Um, another advice is to avoid queuing. Uh, the less queuing you have, the more utilization you can squeeze out of the system. Um, so but we can talk about this later. Uh, Vimal Kumar asks, how do you provide differential queue, uh, quality of service? Something like different queue, uh, latency guaranteed based on uh, customers or use case. So there's a number of algorithms for achieving that. Most of them are based on using multiple queues. So um, you have, let's say, um, play, um, let's say five queues um, numbered from one to five. Um, the, the highest QoS would be queue number one, where in the lowest QoS would be uh, queue number five. And basically, what you do is you service requests from queue number one, um, if you, if there are any, if there's anything in queue number one, and only if queue number one is empty, then you move to queue number two, and if queue number two is empty, then you go to queue number three, and so on, so on, so on. So that's like a basic uh, QoS mechanism, um, and there's a number of uh, different algorithms that are, uh, that behave similar similarly. But most of the algorithms for QoS basically use multi queues, multiple queues. Um, 
Um, Brian Norquist asks, how about reactive back pressure where you communicate how much capacity the service can, can support and is circuit breaker a pattern too much too late? So um, let me ask, uh, answer the first uh, question first. Um, reactive back pressure is very nice. Um, it's, it saves a little bit because you don't have to give a response for every request that you handle. Um, so you're basically batching the, the requests of, of the back pressure. Um, it's very nice where you can implement it. It's not really relevant in RPC type of systems or synchronous systems, but in asynchronous systems, it's very nice. The only problem with it is it's kind of inaccurate because you're not getting a response uh, every time. Um, there's um, a certain time that, that uh, passes between one uh, capacity report and no capacity report. So it's like a little harder to tune, but overall it's more efficient because you need to provide less information. Um, second uh, question is like, is circuit breaker pattern too much late? So circuit breaker is actually, um, it's, it's designed for something a little different. It's designed for when you switch from one uh, type of behavior of the system to another. Uh, when you think the system is, is basically uh, switched between modes. Um, so it's, it's usually a threshold, a static threshold, and um, basically it's designed for very severe uh, situations. It's not designed to be adaptive um, based on, on granular changes in, in load. It's basically designed to catch like uh, and more functions and, and like, uh, stuff like that. Something like that, it's more of a binary thing. So it's designed for, for different types, not for a uh, slight rise in latency, but more for when you, uh, you let's say, um, you went over capacity in, in some uh, subsystem or subsystem is suddenly uh, throwing out too many errors because it has some kind of, uh, that's a database doesn't answer or something like this. So it's kind of designed for something else, more or uh, more less. Um, another anonymous attendee, are there resources that you can recommend to learn more about queuing theory, both from a mathematical perspective as more as well as more practical engineering uh, questions, applications. So yes, there are a number. I actually gave a few uh, workshops and, uh, and master classes on the subject. Um, some of them are online. I'll try to, uh, to add them uh, later. There's a, a very good talk um, called Everything Will Flow. Uh, I think it was in, um, in which conference was it in? I forgot, but um, look it up. It's by Zach Talman. Um, it's called Everything Will Flow. Very, very good lecture. Um, does uh, Gil Tanner did about a uh, little bit of work on this subject. Also very interesting. Um, does of course uh, university courses on the top on the subject um, and uh, a lot of the material that you can find online. Uh, you can look for uh, Q-theory calculators. There's a lot of them on the internet. And also uh, Neil Gutter that was uh, mentioned earlier actually did a lot of work on this and has um, kind of an, um, a language for uh, for doing uh, Q-theory complication. It's uh, I think called PDQ, uh, written in Perl, but still very very useful. So I'm going to go uh, back to uh, the question about uh, Little's law. So I'm going to go back to sorry, I'm going to go back here for a little bit to the part that uh, I missed. Um, We'll take we'll still a few minutes for anyone who uh, wants to stay here and uh, go through that. So uh, little law, Little's law is a mathematical law that most of you probably know. Um, it was very, very hard to prove despite the, the law itself being very simple. Uh, and the reason that it was very hard to prove is that it's very universal. It holds for all the solutions. Um, I'm not going to go into all the mathematical conditions, but basically the, the law states that um, the number of clients in the system uh, on average equals the average throughput times the average latency. And the reason the rule, the rule is uh, very important is because um, you can, because it applies to an except subsystem or in the overall system. Um, so you can actually use it to, to do a lot of uh, system dynamics type of, uh, of analysis and verifications. So just to demonstrate, um, I'm gonna skip this. So one of the things that we do with uh, Little's Law is verify load testing, load tests. Um, for example, correlated omission that uh, someone mentioned before, one of the ways to discover correlated omission is by using Little's Law. You basically take the result 
uh, of the uh, on the low test side, and you compute Little's law, and throughput is assumed assumed to be the same on uh, the application side and the low test side, and then you basically compare the results. So you you, you uh, say, okay, this is the latest value. So here, this is the latest value. So here, and you compare the number of clients in the system on both sides, and then you can discover that some of the clients were actually queued on the load testing uh, tool side, which means that the load testing tool actually, actually was out of capacity or had correlated emission. That's one of the ways to discover this. So that's one of the uses for Little's Law. Uh, other uses, um, many times you don't have a direct measurement of the, the size of the queue. Um, maybe you know the library didn't uh, produce this metric or it's changing too fast or a number of other reasons. And the only way to get an, a measurement of this is using Little's Law, um, called system analysis, capacity planning, and so on, so on, so on. Um, another very nice example of, uh, of doing this type of analysis is let's say that we have a load balancer that uses the list connections algorithm and a bunch of servers, let's say 10 servers, and um, using doing normal operations, the load would spread evenly, but if one of the servers has a failure, let's say it can't connect to the database, it starts returning errors very, very fast, uh, let's say 100 times faster than by Little's law, if we um, if you do an analysis by Little's law, um, because these connections basically means that there are going to be the same number of clients in, in each of the servers, we can see that the, the, the faulty server will receive 100 times more throughput, which means that one faulty server can cause your entire system to crash, which like the reason you have multiple servers is that this won't, won't happen. Um, but as you can see from little though, it will happen on list connections uh, uh, algorithm and load balancer. So what can you do against this? Either use something like uh, random distribution on the uh, load balancer, uh, which is immune to this, or, um, or round robin also immune to this, or just cap, like put a static cap. If you know the server can handle, let's say 100 requests per second, put a cap of, of 150 requ uh, requests per second. Uh, all of the load balancers support this. Uh, so um, that it won't have too much traffic when it starts to speed up suddenly. Okay, so let's go back here. And, and there was another question by Gilad Hoch. A follow up for the utilization question. Would it be more beneficial to pursue elasticity? Uh, if you can scale out dynamically, then why not always maximum utilization? Um, there's a very good explanation for this. If you're talking about per server utilization to reach a, a per, um, to maximize, as you call it, the utilization of a single server, you will have to be to have very high latency on that server, and you don't want to have high latency. So it doesn't matter doesn't matter how many servers you have. If you want to have, let's say, 90% CPU utilization, you're going to pay with latency. Or alternatively, you can reduce the variation of the, of the server or have a faster server. Um, but this is why, basically. Um, Autoscaling does not solve the problem of, of queuing, unfortunately. It can improve queuing. Um, we haven't discussed the models for multiple servers. So it, it can potentially improve queuing um, um, due to, um, to, to basically multiple servers, uh, servers in the same queue. Uh, but again, it's a trade-off that we can discuss later if you're interested in that. But again, remember, when you're talking about utilization, there's the cluster-wide utilization, um, but the cluster-wide utilization is, is composed of the single server utilization. The single server utilization is the problem here. So if there aren't any more questions, I'm gonna give it like two, 10 seconds. Um, we'll go through, uh, sorry, keep takeaways and finish this. So, um, Takeaways, key takeaways. First of all, you can and, pro and probably should apply mathematical tools and mathematical models to analyze your system. It's very, very helpful. You can learn a lot of, a lot of things. There's a lot of insights that you can gain from this. Um, in general, using mathematics for, uh, for software engineering is very, very useful. Um, you wanna do proper capacity planning because it's gonna save you a lot of troubles in, both on queuing latency and crashes that are caused by queues filling up. You want to implement black pressure in all of your systems. Um, if you have an asynchronous black uh, system, you definitely want to do this to avoid the uh, problems. And of course, 
reducing variation is the best way to improve system resilience and utilization and performance. Um, oh, wait, we have another question? No. Great. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to finish this now. Um, we're going to send by email later the, the links for the video and, uh, and the slides and the QO emulator. And you can reach me at, on Twitter or, um, or by mail. Uh, my Twitter handle is, is here. It's Stuhl Nukenberg. Feel free to talk to me. Um, I really appreciate it. Also, you can catch me on the Scylla user Slack, um, where our open source users are talking. Um, feel free to join the discussion. Thank you very much.